Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our webinar, uh, What Business Owners Need to Know About Corporate Law. Uh, we've got a great speaker today, a partner at Huey Lawyers, uh, Nader Benais. I hope I'm saying that right after all the years I've known him. Um, he's a great guy and very knowledgeable uh, for all things private company, uh, small business law. Uh, we've got a bunch of attendees on right now, uh, but as usual, if you're used to these webinars, I usually like to give people a couple more minutes to join. So I'm just going to throw this whole thing on hold for a second. Uh, I wish I had some elevator music, but I don't. Uh, so maybe just uh, put some elevator music on for yourself and uh, or I can pick up one of these guitars and start playing a jam for you. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe not. Anyways, give me a couple of minutes here. and We'll be live. Nader, I've got your desktop up um, and everybody's I'm going on mute. OK. Thanks, Clayton. So I'll just wait for your uh, for your communication that we should proceed. Sounds good. OK. Okay, so I think I think that we'll get going here. Um, so I want to welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, a few housekeeping items. Next week's webinar is uh, going to be about what business owners need to know about driving sales um, during the recovery. We've got an awesome business coach, Marty Park, um, who's a, a well-known author. Uh, about entrepreneurialism and serial entrepreneur. He'll be on next week. And so when you see the uh, pop up for that, be sure to join and register. Um, also, if you have any questions for Nader, I'm sure lots of you have great legal questions. Ronnie's going to make an announcement in the Q&A right now to sort of show you where to enter those questions. Um, those questions by and large will remain confidential um, until Ronnie clicks the publish button. So just make sure that you uh, don't put any sensitive anything in there. And uh, I think what Nader's about to tell you is that uh, his presentation is not meant to give you any advice. Um, and if you need specific advice, you should reach out to your lawyer or Nader. Nader's a great lawyer. And from my experience anyways, um, he's helped us a lot. And without further ado, uh, I'm going to put you up on screen, Nader. So let's have a big smile. And here is Nader Benaisa, uh, what you need to know about uh, corporate law. Thanks for the introduction and the kind words, Clayton. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. I'm here to talk about corporate law in Alberta for private enterprises with the goal to uh, taking you through some of the most common issues that we see as corporate commercial lawyers uh, when we're involved on our client files and also just to give you a quick refresher on basic obligations under the Business Corporations Act of Alberta. Look through to the next technical difficulties already, of course. Here we go. Yeah, and so just as Clayton quickly mentioned uh, the information presented in this seminar is for general informational purposes. Uh, if you do have any questions about any particular legal issue, definitely encourage you to speak with your lawyer or to get in contact with us at Huey and Company 
uh, by telephone or email. Um, so if there's any spe specific particular issue that you'd like to raise with me um, that maybe pertains to a situation that you're involved in currently, uh, I'd be happy to discuss that with you uh, on a confidential basis after the presentation. Um, I can provide you with my contact information at the end of the presentation. Uh, so I'll just start with a little uh, quote here from DHOC. DHOC was the founder of Visa, and I think this is very much applicable to the presentation today. Heaven is purpose, principle and people. Purgatory is paper and procedure. Hell is rules and regulations. Uh, so we're very much going to kind of wade into the depths of hell over the course of this presentation, with you to taking you to uh, purgatory and, and hopefully on an ongoing basis have you in heaven with respect to uh you know fulfilling with your basic uh fulfilling your basic legal obligations or the company's basic legal, legal obligations under applicable statute so that when and if issues do arise uh you you know given given that you have been fully compliant with applicable leg legislation uh hopefully we're, we're hoping to avoid some of those pain points when specific issues arise and i will address some of the common scenarios that we are approached on in relation to non-compliance under the Business Corporations Act uh, and common law with respect to corporations or, for example, your position as a director, officer, shareholder. Of the company. So just to quickly cover off some of the common business vehicles uh, for private enterprises, most of which you will be familiar with, we have corporations, which we'll discuss in further detail in this presentation. There are also partnerships, so you may be uh, a partner of some partnership. There are two different types of partnerships, general and limited. Uh, the hallmarks of a general par partnership are two people, two or more people that have engaged in or that are running some sort of business. So you can contrast that against a sole proprietorship where you just have one person running a business. And whether it's a sole proprietorship or a general partnership, uh, in those cases, the individuals themselves are running the business. One of the other hallmarks of a general partnership is that all of the partners are jointly and severally liable for uh, the obligations and liabilities of the general partnership. So, for example, uh, any partner can bind the general partnership to a liability by signing a contract. And if there is some form of claim against the general partnership, uh, all of the partners will be jointly and severally, in other words, equally responsible for the liabilities of the general partnership. So if one of your partners were to run off, uh, you would be left holding the bag. This is why general partnerships are not commonly used uh, for carrying on business. There are also limited partnerships. Those are formed under statute, uh, specifically the Partnership Act of Alberta. Uh, limited partnership provides uh, the partners of the business, for the limited partners, I should say, with uh, limited liability coverage. So in a limited partnership scenario, you will have two different kinds of partners. Uh, one partner will be a general partner and the other partners typically in most scenarios will be limited partners. The general partner would be responsible uh, without limitation for all liabilities of the limited partnership. The limited partners will only be liable for contributions made, capital contributions made to the limited partnership. So this is a great vehicle uh, for business and is commonly commonly used in, in a variety of industries, principally the construction and development industry. There are also a number of uh, income tax considerations that go into determining uh, whether a limited partnership would be the right business vehicle to use. So always a good, good, always a good plan to get advice from your, uh, from your tax advisor, be it Clayton Aiken or somebody else, and from uh, legal with respect to what would be the right business entity for you to use in carrying on any particular uh, business activity. And in some cases, it might be that a limited partnership would be a, a great vehicle for you guys to use for legal and tax reasons. And then there are joint ventures. Joint ventures, um, what uh, I suppose distinguishes joint ventures from other business organizations is that they are formed typically by agreement and they are meant to focus on one specific activity with the joint venture uh, with the joint venture terminating upon completion of that specific business activity. So for example, if you are buying a property to develop and sell 
in uh, as one joint venture party with other joint venture parties, then uh, upon the sale of that property, the joint venture would typically come to an end. We can also distinguish joint ventures from other forms of business entities in that typically the joint venture agreement will contemplate that the joint venture partners or joint venture parties can continue to carry on their business, their respective businesses without any sort of conflict uh, with the other joint venture partners, part, parties. So oftentimes we will have joint venture parties from one industry get together through a joint venture agreement, agreement to carry out a specific project. And in circumstances, in other circumstances, there, it, such as a limited partnership or a corporation, their legal issues may arise because these, uh, the partners of the joint venture parties are involved in competing businesses. In a joint venture circumstance, it is typically contemplated that each of the joint venturers will continue to run their own businesses and that that will not be the source of a claim or uh, underlie a claim between the joint venture parties. And then finally, we have sole proprietorships. Uh, you know, sole proprietorships probably don't require a, a lot of time here, but it's when an individual car carries on a business as that individual, that is not through any other sort of corporate entity, be it a corporation or a limited partnership. One important note is that in Alberta, if, if you are running a sole proprietorship other than under your own name, so for example, if I was running a business and I didn't call that business Nader Benisa, I am required to file uh, or to register for a trade name uh, to carry on business under that uh, name. So very important, I suppose, one of the things that people typically consider with respect to sole proprietorships is uh, whether it, it, it is the fact that sole proprietorships do not provide you with limited liability protection. So if there is uh, some sort of claim or liability that arises from your business operations, your personal assets. And that takes us to the next slide, choice of business vehicles. I'll quickly run through them. How do, how do you, how do I decide which entity to use uh, when starting a business? There are a, a variety of factors that you should take into consideration with advice from professionals, Canadian and uh, foreign income tax considerations. Who will be operating the business? Is it one or more people? So for example, should I be running this as a partnership or is, is it a sole proprietorship? Mechanism separating business assets business liabilities and personal assets from business assets and liabilities. That's almost always one of the most important, important considerations along with income tax considerations when we're discussing uh, the correct business vehicle to launch your business with. To what extent is it important to separate business assets from business liabilities? Uh, so, for example, are we talking about one or more corporations? What sort of structure should we use so that there is a clear uh, that there is some protection that it, that is afforded to the assets of the business from the liabilities of the business? And then, of course, fundamentally, what sort of protections should be available uh, so that uh, to, to distinguish or separate your personal assets from the business assets and liabilities? And then, an important consideration. You know, so, so Nader, just question. like. A just to jump in there because it's really relevant is, you know, maybe you're in a high risk business and you've got, you know, just to bring that, bring that to what I was thinking is I got a house, I got a car, I got a family, right. And, uh, and I'm opening a business and maybe that business has some inherent liabilities that I maybe don't have covered by an insurance policy. And so now do you want to, do you want to expose your mortgage or your sorry, your house, um, your your vehicle, your vacation property, your kids' financial, your, your kids, the financing that's going to be used for your kids' education in the future, um, to the liabilities of of the business. So I, I think that's really a key point, right? Um, yeah, uh, just interesting thought because that's really we talk about that a lot, and I wish I could advise on that more, uh, but I'm not a lawyer and I don't know enough about it. So thank you for bringing that up. No, and thanks for driving that point home, Clayton, in terms that are perhaps a bit more approachable. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That is that is exactly what we're talking about here. And I'd add to that, um, in relation to a more mature business, one of the things that Clayton and I 
um, we'll, we'll talk about sometimes is do we want to have the valuable assets that are commonly used in carrying on a business exposed to the liabilities of the business? So, for example, you've been operating your business successfully for 15 years. You've decided, uh, you know, in, in discussing business matters with your financial advisors and or your accountants that you instead of leasing a uh, certain property that you use to carry on your business, you want to buy that property. One of the cons considerations that should be at the forefront of your decision making is whether you want that valuable asset, you know, you've saved a million dollars or half a million dollars, and you're now putting that to work by buying property from which you will carry on the business. Do you want to have that half a million dollars exposed to the liabilities of the business in the company that you currently carry on your business from, or should we be looking at putting that asset somewhere else? So moving on, marketability and transferability of securities is a key consideration, but also typically arises later on in the process uh, in two key, two key circumstances. One is when you are looking to raise money for your business. And I would suggest that it would be difficult if we were looking at uh, the capital markets to raise money uh, if you're running a sole proprietorship. Sometimes it's also difficult uh, for limited partnerships and other types of kind of less common business business organizations to raise money just because investors are confused or not comfortable with the specific type of business vehicle that is being used. So again, one of the things that you should be thinking about is how much capital do I need to raise? Where am I going to get that capital from? If you're going to get that capital from the capital markets or from a, a private placement with a you know, venture capital organization or some such other thing, the type of business vehicle that you use to carry on your business and to raise funds will be applicable when you are looking for investment. And then of course, the other uh, point where the transferability of securities arises is on sale. I'm sure you've all heard from your various financial advisors that you should have an exit plan. And when considering what that exit plan looks looks like, you are absolutely going to be and should be discussing um, that exit plan with your lawyers, with your accountants to confirm that the current structure of your business organization uh, will fit in nicely with the exit plan that you guys are talking about from a financial uh, perspective. And then, of, of course, costs. How much does it cost to set up the business organization that, that you're thinking about? Uh, and how much does it cost to maintain that business organization on a go forward basis? So maybe if you're running a small business from your home and there are very limited opportunities to, be, or that business would expose you to limited liability, maybe the sole proprietorship would be the best option for you because the cost of setting it up and carrying it on would be minimal. Um, or maybe in other circumstances, it would be a corporation. And then we start getting more and more expensive with limited partnerships and joint ventures. So costs would be a key consideration. Just gonna look at my time here. I think I'm gonna have to uh, go through these slides a bit more quickly. Um, so here's a quick overview of what we will be discussing. And I'll just slide right on. So first, incorporation requirements. I presume here that most people are um, already running a business. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to spend a lot of time on this. In terms of setting up a company in Alberta, there are several things that you have to do. The first is to do a nuance search. If you are planning on using, uh, or if you're planning on incorporating a company that is named, so for example, uh, ABC Fun and Factory Limited, you would have to run a nuance search. That nuance search, uh, it provided a compass back clear. That is, there is no other business in Canada that is using a substantially similar name. Uh, if that nuance search comes back clear, then you can proceed to incorporate your company using that name. Uh, it is also required that you fall that, that you file with the registry of Alberta, the corporate registrar of Alberta, articles of incorporation. Those articles of incorporation are what we call a constating document. So one one of the ways to think about this is is articles of incorporation are the constitution uh, is 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 the constitution of the company, like the constitution of Canada. It sets up special rules that relate to the company that cannot be changed um, except with you know uh, 
a, a, a special threshold of approval of the shareholders of the company. Articles of incorporation will typically contemplate or will have to con contemplate the company's share capital. So when we're talking about share capital and share provisions, we're, we're talking about how many different classes of shares, if there are in fact more than one classes of shares, how many shares can be issued from each class, what are the special rights and privileges and obligations that are afforded to or required of holders of the shares of that class? So the three kind of fundamental rights and privileges of shareholders would be the right to vote, the right to receive dividends, and the right to receive property upon a dissolution or wind up of the company. And the Business Corporations Act provides that at least one class of the corporation's shares bears the right to vote, bears the right to receive dividends, and bears the right uh, to receive the company's property upon a dissolution or wind up of that company. And then articles of incorporation, though not required to, will also commonly include um, you know, a minimum and maximum number of directors of the corporation that can be appointed, or in some cases, a fixed number of directors that can be appointed or that will that, that must be appointed. And then sometimes, but rarely, it will include restrictions on business. Uh, on the business activities that can be carried on by the company. Uh, the other uh, documents that are required when you are incorporating are a notice of address and initial directors. The notice of address pertains to uh, an address that is going to be designated as the registered office of the company. That's a very important piece um, that not enough of my clients understand. Uh, so we'll get into what a registered office is uh, later on in this presentation. And then one of the other documents that you must, must, must have when you set up, though not required um, by law, is uh, our bylaws. Bylaws commonly provide, they're, they're also formed part of what we call the constating documents or the constitution of, of the corporation. They provide for many different things, things like procedures for meetings, officers, uh, the, the, the type of, types of officers that can be appointed, type of committee, committees can be formed or in some cases standing committees that must be formed and must uh, must exist for the duration of the corporation's corporation and then things like indemnification of the officers and directors of the company. All too often unfortunately I see people um, or I have clients that come in uh, without bylaws and this can be a particular issue when there are disputes between shareholders or the board or where there is a financing that is about to take place or where there is uh, an exit event. So somebody is selling or we're bringing somebody else in. You know, um, Nader, um, just on that, if I could jump in, because it's a great point and you really nailed it. I, and I was about to ask you, like, what? there's so many of my clients that come in and go, I went down to the registry and paid them 300 bucks and here's a wad of paper that I got. And, and you go, well, who owns the company? And they say, often, too, all too often, is go, I don't know, I own the company. And well, do you have share certificates? Well, no. And you know, I can't count the times that that's happened. And so, you know, what would you just quickly say to somebody in that position? Why does it matter to do a little bit better than that? So yeah, no um, disputes. Uh, when uh, I've just, I'm, I'm working on a file right now. We're dealing with a dispute between shareholders where there were no bylaws in place, and I just so happen to be um, the, the majority shareholders, a group of majority shareholders, and. Since there were no bylaws in place, we had to go through a convoluted process of calling meetings, getting bylaws in place so that we could then hold other meetings. And in the context of a dispute between shareholders, you know, and, and there was a lot of money spent in order for us to do that because we had to do, you know, we had to take a number of steps that otherwise wouldn't have been required had bylaws been in place. Um, so having these established from the get-go is important and is something that is often not done and although may not be an issue, can often be an issue, um, particularly in circumstances of disputes. I'll give you another example. Uh, recently, you know, with everything that's gone on with COVID and the various programs that are out there, a lot of people are taking advantage of loan programs provided by the federal government right now or are having to refinance current uh, credit facilities with their lenders as a result of ceasing operations and so on and so forth. Now, when that takes place, what's going to happen is your lender is, is going to appoint legal counsel to uh, to act for them in 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 when when in terms of preparing documentation and doing due diligence on you. And 
I hate to say this, but I had one client call up and 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 he was actually crying. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, like fantastic business person, really successful, going through a, a very very tough patch in terms of business right now. But what they had done was there was um, uh, so they went to get some some refinancing. And what always happens is the lawyer that's acting for the lender is going to pour through all the constating documents, all of the, all of the uh, all of the minute books of, of the corporation if one even exists. And if it doesn't exist, they're going to come back to you and they're going to say, "We need all of this stuff fixed." So where you have had a company that has, let's say, existed for 10, 15 years and none of that stuff is in place, essentially what ends up happening is the lawyers involved have to go through a bit of a forensic uh kind of investigation of the company's history over 10 years to ensure that all of the basic requirements have been met we got to ascertain who were all of the directors who are all of the shareholders so on and so forth and then put that all up all together and he had just gotten a quote from this national law firm with respect to how much that was going to cost um, because unfortunately um they did not have their books managed well set up by and managed by a professional like a lawyer uh, prior to this. So having to do that 10, 15 years down the road, I can guarantee you it's going to be, you know, multiples in costs uh, than if you did it uh, properly from the get-go and then managed it, uh, you know, annually or regularly. Um, so that is why uh, having, having these books set up properly is so, so important. They are going to be relevant at some stage in the life of this corporation and the life of your organization uh, and probably at multiple stages with respect to disputes, uh, with respect to audits from CRA, Clayton can probably talk about that, with respect to financings, with re respect to sales and acquisitions and the most cost effective, even though it doesn't look like it because you're having a, there's an initial outlay here, but the most cost effective approach is to have that done properly uh, from the outset and then managed on an annual or uh, regular basis going forward. Thank you. And I can I can attest that for most people, the annual maintenance cost is not a lot. So I didn't it's want a to couple park hundred dollars. Later, but yeah, yeah no, exactly. no problem at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, moving on here. Uh, so the Business Corporations Act provides that there must be a meeting of directors following the incorporation of the company. The meeting would typically consider a number of things, uh, the approving uh, of bylaws, which we just discussed, appointment of certain officers, uh, opening bank accounts, issuing chair, so, so forth. So when we incorporate a company for a client, uh, one of the first resolutions that is prepared is an initial resolution of the board of directors where these matters are considered and approved. And then one of the other uh, very important requirements that people should be aware of when they incorporate is that they must the corporation must hold the annual general meeting of the shareholders within 18 months from the date of incorporation moving on annual requirements again i'll try not to get too bogged down uh, in the details here but the annual requirements for a corporation as uh, contemplated uh, by the business corporations are of course many of you are familiar with an annual return must be filed. That must be filed within 30 days of um, of the incorporation date, uh, of the first anniversary of the incorporation date of the corporation, and then every year thereafter. Uh, that annual return will include information about the di current directors and shareholders as of that date. And it's very important that that be filed and uh, correctly prepared for reasons to be discussed later. Uh, if not filed within a period of two years and six months, the corporation will be automatically dis dissolved uh, by the uh, Registrar of Corporations, and you will then have to revive the co company, which is an expensive process. So please do uh, comply with those uh, annual return filings. Uh, uh, to give you another example uh, of why it's important to get professionals involved on doing this type of work for you and, and for maintaining the books, uh, to, to go back to, uh, you know, for example, a financing, if these annual returns are not filed or not included in the minute books, the uh, lender's counsel, or if you're hiring your own counsel, borrower's counsel, will have to pull all of these annual returns from the corporate registry, each of which is comes at a cost. So again, important to both uh, comply with these obligations or these requirements, and then also to maintain proper books and records maintain a minute book, 
so that when you come to these particular points, you are not having to um, outlay a whole bunch of money that you were not expecting to having having to spend. Um, and then we go on to uh, the annual general meetings of which must occur. We spoke about the first one having to be done in the first 18 months of the corporation. Thereafter, an annual general meeting of shareholders must be held within 15 months of the date of the last AGM. And things that are commonly considered there or that, that are commonly put to the shareholders or must in some cases be put to, put to the shareholders are the election of the directors of the corporation. Uh, the uh, notice of meeting of annual general meeting must include financial statements that have been approved by the board. Uh, the uh, annual shareholders at the annual general meeting will be asked to consider and appoint an auditor or waive the requirement to appoint an auditor for the corporation. And though not commonly done, it is required that the notice of annual general meeting uh, include details on the aggregate remuneration paid to the board of directors and the five highest paid officers. And then oftentimes there will be other business that's contemplated in annual, at an annual general meeting of shareholders, such as, um, for example, um, uh, equity compensation plans to employees, directors and officers, um, changes to bylaws, changes to the articles of incorporation. Okay, so I got a question here. So, so I, I own a hair salon, it's just me. Like, you know, my, my, my dad gave me some money to help me open up a hair salon it's just me like do i gotta do all this stuff like what what am i doing here you know yeah uh, yes by law you have to do all this stuff uh in rare circumstances and i would suggest limited to um companies that are formed as consulting companies where there is only one owner and essentially that person is a consultant that operates out, out of their home whether or not compliance actually matters I, I could there's a couple of circumstances where compliance doesn't matter but at the end of the day yes compliance is required under, under the uh, business corporations uh, um, uh, statute there are penalties contemplated in uh, the business corporations act if compliance is not adhered to and again I mean as it relates to having to file annual returns uh, ensuring that addresses of directors and, and, and registered offices, offices are updated on a regular basis, there are definitely uh, potential pain points for the business owner that neglects to comply with those uh, requirements. One of those, one, another example would be if you fail to update your registered office, let's say you've taken your hair salon plate and then you've moved it to a new, to a new, uh, to a new office or to a new, uh, uh, to a new, uh, uh, retail location. Product, say. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, you know, the, the the importance of a registered office, we'll get into it, but essentially that is the address at which all, um, at, at which any and all um, notices under any uh, statute can be served on the corporation. And that by sending typically by registered mail or by courier uh, some sort of notice under another statute or under the Business Corporations Act. So let's say, for example, under another statute, the civil rules of court, if you're about to be sued because you've given me a horrible haircut and I'm incredibly pissed and I'm crazy, I could just serve that statement of claim on the registered office, even though it happens to be an outdated address. And I've we've had a number of circumstances where um, our clients have been um, served with paper paperwork at uh, outdated um, uh, addresses and have had default judgments issued against them as a result of that because they just had no knowledge that the uh, claim was ongoing. Uh, and of course, we have to get in there and fix it. So, yeah. the, you know, our, our advice always, and, and, and we'll get into it as well again, your registered office must be open to the general public between the hours of five or Our advice is to appoint either your accounts or your lawyers as, as the registered office for your corporation um, so that for the crazies out there for statements of claims so that you're not so that you're you know you're you ensure that you get any and all fundamental notices or important notices uh, it's best to have a professional appointed as the registered office but we can get back into that in fair day. enough so i mean you got to spend a bit of time every year and just do this paperwork go through the motions and make sure that it's up to date thank you that that was really the answer that i was looking for yeah no my my pleasure and this this slide kind of um contemplates that so the address to which all notices and documents required or permitted to be sent or served under any act may be sent, must be accessible to public during business hours. That's the registered office. 
Um, and then we have the records office here. So uh, what we do as lawyers sometimes serve notice on corporations that we're going to attend their register or their records office to review all of their um, all of their corporate records, particularly where some sort of dispute has been engaged. Um, so it's important for people to know that to comply with the Business Corporations Act of Alberta and not to be called out in these scenarios, you have to have a place where the following is kept. Minutes of meetings, notices required under the Business Corporations Act, you have to have a securities register, you have to, you have to, um, to, to hold your financial statements there, and also a conflict of interest disclosure registry or register. Um, access to corporate records, very important. And just for your informational purposes, um, corporate records must be ma made available to directors, shareholders, and their agents during normal business hours free. Um, copies of articles, bylaws, and unanimous you know, shareholders agreements also must be provided free of charge. Creditors can gain access to records, but not a unanimous shareholders agreement on payment of reasonable fees. Uh, any member of the public should be able to access these corporate reg records, which I've addressed earlier, um, uh, but they would have to pay a reasonable fee. And uh, with respect to your accounting records, they can be kept anywhere in the province of Alberta and in some cases outside of the province of Alberta. Um, no need to get into that, but um, they must be available at all, all reasonable times for examination by directors. So sometimes when we're involved in um, you know, some sort of issue, we have people that uh, try to withhold records from us and we end up referring to these um, applicable sections um, so that we can get some compliance. So important for you to know that if you are, let's say, for example, a director of a company and you're concerned about something that is happening or has happened, or you want to, or you're a shareholder of a company and you want to confirm that your interest in the company, your shares are kept uh, and reflected on the books and records of the co corporation, you have a right to demand production of certain documents. Um, we'll go again quickly through directors, officers, and shareholders here. I, I imagine that most of you are uh, familiar with these different positions, but just to touch on them. Uh, directors are responsible for the business of, of the corporation. Uh, you must have at least one director appointed uh, unless uh, you're uh, unless we're dealing with a public company, then there are other rules at play. Uh, maximum, there's no maximum uh, number of directors that can serve on a board of directors, uh, unless that maximum is set forth in the Articles of Corporation. To be a, di a director, you must be 18 of sound mind and not bankrupt. Uh, so if you do have to claim personal bankruptcy for one reason or another, it's important for you to understand that you can no longer serve as a, as a as a member of a board of directors, but you can again once you've been discharged from bankruptcy. Uh, so oftentimes when we're dealing with these scenarios, we will either, uh, we will have some sort of nominee or some sort of other individual appointed in place of the bankrupt director. And also an important uh, requirement in Alberta and some other uh, uh, provincial jurisdictions is that 25% of the board must be Canadian residents. Uh, or must be residents of Canada. And what does that mean for the purposes of the Business Corporations Act of Al Alberta? Uh, a Canadian resident is someone who is a Canadian citizen that it ordinarily resides in the province of Alberta. So typically there's, you know, kind of a, what we ask our, 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 our clients is, well, are you spending more than six months down in Phoenix or less, right? Um, or a landed Im immigrant that's ordinarily resident in Canada. Uh, there are some exceptions to these rules, um, probably don't have enough time to get into them, but there is an important solution that I'd like to make you all aware of when we're dealing with um, uh, foreign, foreign individuals who are looking, or, or Canadian citizens or landed immigrants who are not ordinarily resident, who are looking to carry on business in the province of Alberta. There are a couple of provinces that do not have uh, this residency requirement. So what we would typically recommend uh, is that we incorporate the company under that um, that other in, in that other province, and then we would um, uh, extra provincially register that company so that it, it can carry on in Alberta a business in Alberta, and so that the non-resident individual can uh, you know uh, can uh, can can serve as a director of the board of that corporation. So there are solutions. Uh, officers. Now you'll all be familiar with officers, chief, chief executive officers, chief operating officers, presidents. These are individuals uh, to whom the uh, power to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the corporation has been delegated 
uh, by the board of directors. Um, so again, they're usually responsible for day-to-day -day operations. They get their authority from the board and they're appointed to uh, their office, such as president, treasurer, or chief operating officer by the board of directors. Uh, shareholders. The, uh, the director and the officer and the shareholder of Clayton E. Aiken Professional Corporation is like Clayton E. Aiken, right? Like in, in small business law, and a lot of these times these overlap, right? Yeah, in most private corporations, they will overlap. And even in, in a lot of public corporations, you will oftentimes see uh, some, a couple of indi individuals operating. Uh, well, actually in all three roles, they'll typically hold shares of a company. They will, uh, some individuals will be named as senior executive officers, such as chief executive officer, may, uh, may, may be a board member. Love it, thanks. Yeah, um, shareholders. So again, we've covered off um, some of the common rights, privileges, and restrictions to cover that, that, uh, that uh, that are, that are in the province of shareholders. So the right to vote, dividends, property on dissolution, um, uh, and shareholders typically have no say in the business of the corporation, um, except as shareholders. It is the board, so that's a very important point. Uh, sometimes issues arise where individuals who are shareholders but who are not members of the board of directors take issue with these decisions made by the board. And in rare and limited circumstances, Typically, the courts have come down and said, uh, you know what, as a shareholder, you just don't have the right to involve yourself to that extent. And we will cover off some of the rights that are uh, granted to shareholders under the Business Corporations Act to approve or not approve certain, um, certain decisions or actions being uh, uh, proposed by the Board of Directors, and we'll get into that. But one thing to note, a lot of people have unanimous shareholders agreements in uh, when they are a uh, shareholder of a, uh, a private corporation and also serving on the board or maybe not. One of the things that's important for people to note is to be very careful in the drafting of these un unanimous shareholders agreements. If power is given to the unanimous shareholders to, an, to the extent that uh, the shareholders then essentially perform the duties and responsibilities of the board of directors, the shareholders themselves may have exposed themselves uh, to liabilities that would otherwise only accrue to uh, directors. So very important, Very be very careful when drafting uh, or reviewing unanimous shareholders agreements so that you don't turn yourself from somebody who has, uh, who is not exposed to the liabilities of the directors of a corporation into someone who is. Uh, so duties of directors and officers, uh, to, there, are, there are two principal duties that we focus on one is a fiduciary duty. It's called the duty of loyalty. The second is the du is a duty of care. Uh, directors and officers are special and are, can be distinguished uh, in terms of their duties to a corporation from uh, mere employees in the sense that they are fiduciaries. Um, that is, they have a duty of loyalty to the corporation and that imposes on them further obligations than would otherwise be uh, or that, that that employees are otherwise exposed to. A duty of loyalty requires that the directors and officers act honestly and in good faith at all times with a view to the best interests of the corporation. One of the things that's very important in a, in a situation that we come across uh, routinely is that directors and officers understand that this duty, that this fiduciary duty uh, exists even after they are no longer serving as directors or officers of the company. That is, it is not immediately extinguished once you see to be a director of a company. So if you have recently been a director or officer of a company, you continue to have obligations to that com company uh, that arise from this duty of loyalty. And that is, those, that, those, those duties are specifically not to disclose any confidential information, not to take away a corporate opportunity that, that you were aware of and that existed at the time that you were a, or a director of the company. So taking of a corporate opportunity, for example, would be if there was some opportunity that uh, could be available or would have been available to the corporation that you became aware of and that you didn't disclose to anybody else and you say, all right, well, I'm gonna start this separate business and I'm gonna run this business myself, I'm gonna resign and then I can carry on this business, I'm free and clear. 
if it, if it is established that, that 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 opportunity would have been available to the corporation at the time that you were a director of it, you will certainly be liable. And there's um, ample case law out there uh, um, uh, confirming that directors that do or former directors that do do those sorts of things will have to answer um, to the company and to the company's shareholders. Um, and then the uh, sorry, that's a that's a great spot for me to ask somebody's question that has been posted here. Um, so Nader, you mentioned if a company may be risky and want to minimize the risk of other personal assets and the like. What about this to the spouse? So don't make the spouse a director of the shareholder so they won't be legally responsible for future liabilities. Yes, 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 and yes. Yeah. So if you do have a company where. Uh, for one reason or another, um, both spouses are shareholders. We will have that conversation with people and we will, our, our advice, in, except in rare scenarios, sometimes, you know, we, we take people through the potential downsides of not appointing a particular spouse as a director and officer, particularly in family law situations where there is a subsequent breakup of, of the marriage and then the individual who is not appointed as a director or shareholder, or sorry, director or officer, now is wants to be a director. So there are some considerations there, but in most cases, it makes zero sense to have both um, spouses named as directors and officers. And it should just be one. Thank you. I'm sure you nailed that question for for anonymous. Anonymous, if you got a follow up, feel free to post it. And one of the um, and 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 pertaining to the duty of loyalty, oftentimes where there are uh, where there's a, a dispute between several owner managers of a business, um, inevitably somebody's going to ask, "Well, can I just leave and set up another company and start operating the same business?" There's no non-compete in place. There's no non-solicit in place. There's none of these. You know, there there are no agreements that that require that. Um, or that would prevent me from doing that. Speaking again to the ongoing exposure of directors and officers, uh, or the ongoing duties of directors and officers, even after they cease to be directors and officers of a company, our advice to, to individuals is typically, no, you cannot do that. Uh, by doing that, by taking a customer list or by taking customers of the business, you're taking corporate opportunities of that of that corporation. And because of this special duty, this fiduciary duty, you can't just resign, set up another company and then start competing with that company. Uh, there is a time frame here and the time frame, there is a time frame in which that obligation will end. The time frame depends on all of the circumstances. And if any of you are considering that or going through that as an issue or have a partner that is attempting to do that, Definitely contact legal. Um, and then the other one is uh, director, the, the, the other obligation of uh, directors and officers to the corporation is that they owe the corporation a duty of care. You got to, you know, be careful and diligent and skillful uh, in carrying out your duties as a director and officer. And if you fail to do so, then you may be potentially liable to the corporation. Um, but one important point here, because after having said all of this it, it it may create the the impress your uh, the impression that 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 ascent directors and officers are are very 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 much exposed to the to the corporations that they represent and while that is true while they do have to comply with these fundamental duties there's this concept of uh, uh or this a legal principle called the business judgment rule which provides that the when, when determining whether a director uh, fulfilled, for example, uh, his or her obligation um, uh, to, 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 to be careful and diligent in, in taking an action or making a decision, the courts, judges are not going to, are not going to place themselves in the position of decision maker with respect to whether one amongst a number of reasonable different decisions uh, whether whether one was better than the others, and if if the director failed to take the best one, that that director would be liable. That is absolutely not the state of the law on this issue. The business judgment principle says that we're not going to put ourselves, or a decision maker, or a judge is not going to put him or herself 
in the shoes of the directors, so long as the decision taken was reasonable, prudent, and took into account the interest, uh, best interests of the corporation, even if that turned out to be the, uh, the wrong decision, and maybe even a, uh, a, a, a very wrong decision, the directors and officers will not be punished and will not be liable to the company or its shareholders as a result of making that decision. That is, the judges will not uh, engage in minute detail or engage in the mi minutia of trying to determine which amongst a number of reasonable decisions was the best decision. So long as the decision taken, the action taken was reasonable, uh, then the director and officer or officer will not be liable to the company. Okay. I got, uh, so we got nine minutes left and I got two more questions in the queue. Okay. Um, so how do you want to manage that? Do you want to keep flying and we'll save a couple minutes at the end? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm Sounds just, good. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm I so guess sorry, guys. The, the I, 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 I just went way over time. So maybe, uh, I mean, maybe we should just jump have, right into questions. Yeah, the one question I have really is on, I guess, can you can you summarize in, you know, I just saw two slides fly by that are so relevant and we deal with it all the time. What in my hair salon example, are, where's my liabilities lie? Like what could what could go wrong there if I'm not being careful of my fiduciary um, and duty of care responsibilities to my hair salon corporation? Like just a, a few quick examples, like one minute. Yeah, sure. So if if you're the sole shareholder, director, and officer, really, there's 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 the only potential exposure to you is is from creditors um, who may take you to task because creditors also have certain and we weren't weren't able to get into them, but oppression remedies and derivative actions. Creditors may have the uh, an ability to bring an action against you as a director of a company if you take certain certain actions. So that's one circumstance under which a sole a, a wholly owned company or a company that's wholly owned by one, one individual may still have some exposure. The other one would be um, uh, after a sale of the business. So okay. since those, if, if, if you, you know, since those um, obligations persist after, even after resignation, um, you may have exposure to uh, an acquirer of, of your business. But otherwise, okay, so really, there's, there's, there's no risk. Thanks. So why do I need so unanimous shareholders agreement? I got I got two partners, you know, a couple different scenarios. Um, we've got a shareholder spouse couple or we've got a shareholder of unrelated uh, people, uh, shareholdings of unrelated people. A lot of people don't have USAs, which effectively, you know, for all intents and purposes is a partnership agreement. What, what are the key parts of that and why should I have one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, why should you have one? Uh, because this provide, I mean, there's there there are so many reasons as to why you need to have one. But um, so when disputes arise between shareholders, uh, a unanimous shareholders agreement typically provides shareholders with the ability to um, buy out another shareholder by way of a shotgun. And I can't tell you how many circumstances I've been in. I mean, at least once a month, or maybe once every two months, will uh, get retained by an individual who's a shareholder of a company, went into business with four people, and either they never prepared one, or they draft, or a lawyer drafted one, but it was never signed. That's also very common. Um, and in those cases, trying to extricate the shareholders from the dispute without having all parties end up in court and spending tens of thousands of dollars becomes very difficult. So if you have a unanimous shareholders agreement in place, place with provisions that are typically covered in the in a unanimous shareholders agreement, you you may have the opportunity to do so uh, to, to extricate yourself or a partner that you don't want to, or sh another shareholder that you don't want to be in business anymore or at, at, in a much quicker manner and in a much more cost efficient manner. So things that are typically considered in, in unanimous shareholders agreements are things like management. Um, and, and all of these speak to why you want to have one in place. So a standard unanimous shareholders agreement will contemplate that, you know, each of the shareholders uh, uh, retains the right to serve as a director for the entire time they hold shares. Uh, it will contemplate restrictions on transfer of shares. So for example, Clayton, you and I have gone into business together. We're opening up a hardware store. I only want to be in business with Clayton. I don't want to be in business with any, anyone else. And maybe we've opened up a uh, 
you know, we're, maybe both of our professional corporations are shareholders. Of the, same. the only way I'm going to restrict, well, the only way I'm going to ensure that I'm only ever doing business with Clayton Aiken is to include a provision in the unanimous shareholders agreement, which provides that neither shareholders nor, nor principals of share, no owners of the shares of a corporate shareholder will transfer their shares without, uh, you know, the, the agreement of the other parties or as otherwise contemplated by the shareholders agreement. Things like right of first refusal clauses, uh, drag alongs and tag alongs, matching bids provide the shareholders with uh, an opportunity to be creative when it comes to exit events or offers from third parties. So a drag along provision is a provision and, and, and provides important min minority protection. So if you hold in your, in your example, Clayton, 20% of a company and there's another majority shareholder, um, you know, and that majority shareholder gets an offer to buy out uh, that majority shareholder's shares, uh, a tag along would provide you with the right to say, hey, hey, we have this agreement in place. It said that if you're leaving, I get to leave too. We have to leave together on the terms and conditions set out in the purchase agreement you receive from that third party. So Got it. Got it. all of these various management uh, financing. So for example, what if the business runs out of money? What are we going to do then? Would each of the share, and we want to continue business, uh, would each of the shareholders have to put money up? A lot of people think that shareholders do have to put money up when a business needs more money because yeah. they talked about it months back. So a, a, a well-drafted unanimous shareholders agreement would consider, uh, you know, cash calls whether shareholders have to contribute funds. Yeah, what happens when I die? Are you going into business with my wife because she's who's getting the shares, et cetera? Okay, two questions, and you have to answer these quickly because we only got four minutes left. Hey, what is the functional? Uh, sorry, we'll go with Roxanne's first. When my clients are purchased corporate owned insurance, there is a resolution that I need to submit with the application. We typically write this up. I give a copy to the client. Should I be sending a copy to this client's lawyer directly? And what other information should I provide to the lawyer around this? So Ro Roxanne um, is one of our uh, wealth planning insurance contacts. That's that's a fantastic question. And I'm glad. Um, and you have two request. minutes because we got another okay. one too. Okay. So. Yes, send it directly to the lawyer because the client will probably never give it to us and then we'll have a... Uh, we'll have an incomplete minute book, which is exactly what we want to avoid. So yes, send it along. What other sort of documentation do you provide? Um, every lawyer is different. Uh, oftentimes, there will be some details that go into a schedule to, una to a unanimous shareholders agreement. So whatever that lawyer's practices are, they'll, they'll, they'll advise you as to what to do. But definitely send the re resolution directly to the lawyer if you have their contact. Thank you. Okay, so... Um... The last one, what is the functional practical difference between a feder federally registered, registered company, um, they say CCPC, which is more, most of my universe, which is a Canadian controlled, that's a tax concept, and one registered in Alberta? So the difference between a Canadian Business Corporations Act Corp and one registered in Alberta, um, costs and fees is one of, the, one of the key differences. So if you're incorporating under the CBCA, you have to actually provincially register in Alberta. So then you're kind of managing two different um, two different concepts, potentially two different charges that are going to be charged to you. The other one is that when you when you prepare the nuance and you open a named company under the uh, uh, Canadian uh, Business Corp Canada's Business Corporations Act, you get protection over the name uh, across the country. Now that wouldn't protect anyone else from using a similar name uh, in association with their products uh, like it doesn't give you trademark protection it's a bit of a it's a bit more of a complicated issue to get into in, in a minute um, so it prevents it would if you incorporate under the CB a named company under the CBCA you get name protection but only as it relates to other people using the exact same or substantially similar corporate name but you don't actually get intellectual property protection over that name under the Trademarks Act. So that I find is a common misconception of, uh, of when people ask me that question. They say, well, if I incorporate federally, I'm gonna have protection over that name. You know, it's gonna be my IP across Canada. That is not the case. Uh, you have to do something different to get that done. So our advice typically, and one of the, other, of course, one of the other considerations is, is whether you're operating nationally or provincially or regionally. So. Um, it's a good question, but unfortunately, something that can't answer in a minute. Same laws apply to me, though, whether I'm registered under one or the other, right? No, 
No. no. If you're registered under the uh, Canada Business Corporations Act, uh, your company is governed by that act. It is substantially similar uh, to the Alberta Business Corporations Act with some exceptions. Um, so uh, you are required. So if, if you're registered on, under the Canada Business Corporations Act, as it relates to uh, matters between shareholders, directors and officers, statutory matters that are covered by that legislation, that is the legislation that will govern as interpreted under Alberta law. But you, you, but Alberta law will still apply in the sense that that corporation must be extraprovincially registered in the province of Alberta, and all of the stuff that's not contained within the business corporation statute that will all be governed by Alberta law generally. Okay, cool. Well, I think that's all the time we got, guys. I will, uh, I will uh, throw this up on our channel and send out a link to it next week. Thank you so much, Nader uh for uh, for going through this is just it's a it's sort of a fire hose topic of course like most of our topics we're just trying to give a very high level um of what of what you need to know and i, and I think we got a good start here and uh of course if anybody on the call has any uh, specific topics that they'd like covered feel free to email me and uh we'll see you again next week uh for for uh, the next seminar thank you so much thank you